Hello and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and joining me here in the Murrieta Studios is Dr. David Burns. Hi, David. Hi, Fabrice. Dr. David Burns has been a pioneer in the development of cognitive therapy, and he is the creator of the new team therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 20 languages. He is an emeritus adjunct clinical professor of psychiatry at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Welcome to episode 57 of the Feeling Good podcast. And uh, this is our uh, fourth installment on the interpersonal model. Uh, Last time, we finished on the uh, blame cause benefit analysis, and uh, we we had our listeners try to create their own on uh, on, while they were listening. And so, uh, David, after we finished the the blame cause benefit analysis, then there's this uh, evaluation of both columns, and and now we'll, we'll assume that we found the uh, that the cost of blaming. Are higher than the advantages. Right, yeah, that's right. Otherwise, we wouldn't be proceeding, right? That, that, that's right. And so now we're going to see. Yeah, that's right. We're going to see what, what do we do if uh, we have a, a patient who says, "Okay, yes, I, I want to stop blaming." Yeah, absolutely. So just to give an overview of where we're at, when, when if, let's say you're a therapist, uh, although a lot of you who are listening will be general public types or even patients wanting help with your own relationship issues, uh, and that's great too. But if you're a therapist, you you always start out, you know, in team therapy with testing, and you'll be wanting to test at the beginning and end of each session. And so if, if, if during a session an individual you're treating starts talking about someone that they're not getting along with, then you're thinking, well, maybe this is something that the person would, would like to be working on t- today and because yeah. they might have come for depression or, or some other reason, but then they start talking about their conflict with their mother or their wife or, or whoever. And then as a therapist, you're going to spend a period of time on the E equals empathy, uh, just buying into what the person is saying, provide, providing support for them, not trying to help them in any way, not trying to contradict them in any way. And then... Uh, once you've done a great job with empathy and the patient g- gives you an A on empathy, then you, we do what's called a paradoxical agenda setting, which is to find out, is this something that, that the, the person wants help with? And that's kind of what we went over in the, in the last session, some of the paradoxical agenda setting techniques for, for people with troubled relationships. There are other techniques I've developed as well, but the ones we went over are, are a pretty good beginner's toolkit, and you want to do your interpersonal decision-making. Does, does the person want help with this relationship, or do they want out of the relationship? Do, do they just want to talk about the relationship, but they, they don't really really want anything to change? That That's the first issue that has to be resolved. And the second issue is if they want help with the relationship, who do they think is, is more to blame? Who do they think should do more of the changing in this relationship? And, and by the way, um, I would like to point people back to uh, episodes 14 and 15 where you presented the uh, the five secrets of effective communication. Yes. Because that, that, will, that will come up in the, in the work we're doing today. Yes, ab- absolutely. And then if... if, if if they decide that the disadvantages of blame are greater, then you can go on to the M equals methods part of the team therapy session. If they say the advantages of blame are better, then, then I say, you know, sadly, I, I just don't have any tools powerful enough to, to, to help you with this relationship. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, hey, the good news is we could work on, on something else that you want help with. Uh, and, but that's called the gentle ultimatum. It's called sitting, sitting with open hands. Now, if the person wants help, then we get into the exciting part, but also a, a very painful part involving the death of the ego. And I've, I've developed a tool called the Relationship Journal, and it's a five-step tool. And some people think it's a tool to improve communication in troubled relationships, and, and it certainly serves as that. But that's not its true cause or true purpose of this tool, the relationship journal. 
it's a really a tool to bring about interpersonal enlightenment, to, to make people aware. So what do you mean by that? To, well, interpersonal enlightenment is, is to become aware of that, that we create our own interpersonal reality at every moment of every day. Uh-huh. That we, we, we feel like victims when we're in a conflict because we're looking at what the other person is doing wrong. Interpersonal enlightenment is, is to see what you're doing that actually is, is triggering the person, reinforcing the person, encouraging the person, person. You might even say forcing the person to, to treat you badly. And it's kind of a politically unpopular topic. And I would say it's been spiritually unpopular too, because the Buddha tried to promote this 2,500 years ago and, and people couldn't get it on, on any very practical level in those days either, but what I've developed is a very simple tool that will actually bring any individual to a state of interpersonal enlightenment quickly in 10 minutes. The only problem with it is it involves the death of the ego, and that is often a very painful painful death, as as you'll find out in this segment. So, um, you know, one question about this uh, this concept that... Uh, we are creating the interpersonal reality uh, ourselves. Um, are you saying that um, nobody will ever mistreat us as long as we're being empathic and, and uh, listening and and so on? Well, that'll get into a philosophical discussion that's probably maladaptive for this part of the podcast. Maybe we should do that at the end of the podcast All right. and get into really, really how it works. But... Uh, it, it, it is very, very seductive to, to, to think that, uh, that, that we're the victim of, of someone else's badness. And while the tools we'll show in this podcast will uh, clear up a troubled relationship 90% of the time quickly, if, if done skillfully, even with the most horrific people, even, you know, as we've talked about on previous podcasts, I think even with, with a serial killer, you can right. turn, turn yeah. them around very quickly in many cases. But there's, there's no 100% in life, uh, but, but you certainly would have a, you know, 90 to 95% batting average and transforming troubled relationships in, into, uh, intimate ones. But let's talk about how to, how to do it because, you know, the devil's in the details, as, sure. as they say. Now, um, the, the relationship journal is, is based on the concept of specificity. That, and this is a Buddhist concept. It's also a scientific concept. Uh, the, the Buddhist concept, B- Buddha said you, you can only change for, for one brief moment of, of your life, maybe a two or three second moment. Uh, and that, if, if that it would it will take you thousands of reincarnations to, to build up to a moment where you're willing to change even for one one second moment, but if you could change for one second moment, you'd achieve enlightenment, and not only would you achieve enlightenment, the whole universe would become enlightened at the same time because the whole universe is one. And when I first heard that notion, it sounded totally goofy and bizarre. And then I got to thinking about it in the context of troubled relationships, and I, I saw that that's really true. And the relationship journal will show you that this is true in a, in a very practical way. Now, what you do is uh, I, I ask the patient with a troubled relationship, uh, what I'd like you to do is write down one thing the other person said to you that didn't work out very well and write down exactly what what they said and then write down exactly what you said next. And then we can do some really interesting uh, analyses because the entire conflict will be embedded in that one brief five-second exchange between the two people. Just one back and forth. Yeah, just one thing the other person said could have been two or three sentences and then verbatim what, what you said next. And when you do the relationship journal, uh, I, I ask you, you know, write down what the other person said and then what you said next. And then there's a little chart you'll see in the show notes where you tick off how you think the other person was feeling uh, when they said that. And, yeah. and you tick off how, how you were feeling, what were the names of your emotions. Yeah. So I did this at a workshop just to disguise it, to protect the identity of the person uh, Let's say the workshop was in, uh, oh, just Anaheim, California, just, just to put it in a different location. 
and it was sponsored by a hospital for, for the general public, and they, they wanted me to do a full day for therapists and then a half day for the general public. And they had it in a high school gymnasium, and there were maybe two or three hundred people there, and it was, you know, how to develop more loving relationships. And I said, so think of who's the difficult person in your life and write down exactly what the other person said and exactly what you said next. So they took about five minutes to do this. I had the relationship journal as a handout, so yeah. they were all busy writing things down. And then I said, now, who would like to share with us, you know, who who is the difficult person in, in your life? What, what did they say, and, and what did you say next? Well, there was this woman sitting in the front row, and she put up her hand. She was wagging it very excitedly, and I, I could see she really wanted me to call on her, so... I called on her and I said, well, who's the difficult person in your life? And she said, my husband. And uh, I said, well, tell Pretty me. common. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> she, she said, well, he's been criti- criticizing me all day, every day for 25 years. And and I want to know why are men like that? That's why I came to this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, well, you know, scientists don't yet know why men are the way they are or why women are the way they are. <laughs> But if you would tell me what you wrote down, what what is what did your husband say to you, and what exactly did you say next, and then then perhaps we can we can find out. Uh, so so she said, well, just y- yesterday uh, in the last last evening, my husband uh, said to me, you never listen, and she said, so I wrote that down in step one on the relationship journal, and I said, that's great. So he said, "Never, you never listen. Then I said, now, what exactly did, did you say next? And, and she said, well, uh, uh, I usually just say nothing and ignore him. And when she said that, the whole audience cracked up and started laughing because <laughs> they could see something that is, apparently she, she was not, she was not uh, seeing. Now, the... Uh, Which, by the way, this points out that a poss- possible response is no response. Yes, that's a response. Exactly, exactly. We often respond like like that when we're under criticism from yeah. from somebody. Uh, so um, now the third step on the relationship journal is, as you can see, if you look at the show notes, is is called uh, analysis of step two, analysis of your own response. Because if, right. if you're going to stop blaming the other person and look at yourself, then we have to see what are the characteristics of your response. Your response was your response an example of good communication or bad communication, and there's a little checklist right on the relationship journal now, and it goes around the acronym E A R. Uh, speak with your E A R, and E is empathy, A is assertiveness, and R is respect. And there's a little checkbox showing what is a, a, a good empathic response and what is a bad empathic response. Yeah. And, a, and a good empathic response would be you acknowledge the other person's feelings, you find some truth in what they're, they're saying so they can see that you got the message. Uh, a good assertiveness, A equals assertiveness, E-A-R, response would be to share your feelings openly uh, and respectfully so the other person could see how, how, how you're feeling. And then our respect means to do these first two steps in the spirit of love, affection, response, respect. You you can be angry, but you can share your anger in in a respectful way. Um, And and then bad communication would be for E equals empathy. You you don't empathize. You don't acknowledge the other person's uh, feelings. A, assertiveness, you don't share your own feelings. Instead, you argue, you defend yourself, you put the other person down. And in terms of respect, you don't treat the other person with warmth or compassion or admiration. Instead, you belittle them or or argue with them or try to get back at them or try to put them down, try to defeat them as if you're in some kind of competition. So uh, would we say her response of saying nothing was an example of good or bad communication. Well, that sounds like bad communication. She uh, she strikes out uh, three out of three. Exactly, and our listeners are would will if you're doing this on paper for yourself. I think you'll find the same thing. And when I do this in workshops for mental health professionals who are supposedly experts, 
And they talk about a conflict with their spouse, with their mother, their son. Oh, we, we never have any, any problems <laughs> yeah. with our relationship. <laughs> exactly. You'll also see generally three out of three. Now, notice the impact on this on this woman and, and, and the audience. She didn't acknowledge his feelings. She didn't share her own feelings. She didn't treat him with, with respect. Right. So she came to the workshop with the idea. Her husband wasn't there, by the way. You know, she came without him. But Was she a mental health professional? No, this was general public. Okay, yeah. Uh, but um, she comes in wagging the figure of blame at her husband, and suddenly it turns around and is pointing directly at her when she looks at the way she's interacting with her husband. That That's the beauty of, you know, of judging other people. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're a mirror for us. You know? Yes, yeah. Good, good way to put it. Um, now, as a therapist, um, the, the patient may get very defensive at this point because you've blown the patient's cover. Yeah. The, the, the patient wanted, generally wants the therapist, or even if you're a friend and you, someone you know is complaining about Yeah, they someone. want sympathy, yeah. Yeah, they want sympathy. They want you to, wanted, she wanted me to agree that her men are, you know, overly critical and men have this or that problem or her husband has this or that problem. And we're, 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 we're looking at, at her. And the patient might at this point bail out and decide they don't want this, this, this kind of therapy. Uh, certainly, uh, therapeutic warmth is very important in this kind of therapy because this is a very brutal, aggressive f- form of treatment of, of relationship problems. And, and again, if the patient can endure it, we're going to move her or whoever is the patient in, into enlightenment and then show them how to develop the, the love that they've, that they've been yearning for. So there, there's a potential great outcome. But this the, part of it is painful. The, the word brutal is not something you hear commonly in terms of uh, therapeutic intervention. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe with, uh, uh, yeah. with uh, people <laughs> in the madhouse. But <laughs> yeah, that, that's right, that's right. Uh, but it does allow you to see your own role in the problem. Now, the, the next step, if the patient can endure this, is, uh, uh, is, is called step four, consequences. This is the interpersonal enlightenment step. And you have to write this, again, on, on the form. Now that you've seen that your response is an example of bad communication, you ask yourself, how will that affect the other person? What will they think and feel? What will they do next? So her husband is saying, you never listen, and then she sits and angrily ignores him. What will he, con- what will he conclude? I'm right. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so he'll conclude uh, that, that, um, that, that, she, that, she, that she never listens. So who is forcing him to think that way? In, at least in this case, she is, yes. Right. So who's forcing her, him to criticize her? She is. Yeah. So she's been forcing him to criticize her for 25 years. She's every time they've interacted, she's responded to him like, like this. And this is. We assume, yeah. 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 And th- this, this is the death of the ego. When you suddenly see that you're forcing the very problem that, that, that you're complaining about. And it's very painful. And when I do this on my own relationship conflicts, I hate it because I, it's painful for me to, to see how, how I've caused the very problem that I'm complaining about. It's comforting to me to blame other people and to feel morally superior. But th- th- this hurts. But, but if, if, if you have the courage to do it, it opens the door to, to intimacy because if you have the power to, to cause this problem then you have the power to, to suddenly turn it around by, by changing the way you respond to, to that other person. So you mean you don't take choice number three in the interpersonal decision-making, usually? <laughs> what, I can't remember what choice number that, three. That would be the status quo. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, We're, stay the miserable. Person, the person, I've had many people who bailed out, and they, 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 did, they suddenly decided they didn't want to continue with the, the relationship. Girl, they, they, they just weren't interested in examining their, their role or giving up the idea that they yeah. were a victim of, of the other person's bad, bad behavior. Now, 
if if the person can, but, but but so what we've done now in step four, and all the listeners can do this is, is this is a quick way to achieve enlightenment. You, you t- take one person that you're not getting along with, put down one thing they said, one thing you said next, do it on the relationship journal, and then say was this was your response good or bad communication. And you'll see pretty much every time that you didn't listen, you didn't use empathy, you, you didn't share your feelings openly, and you didn't convey warmth or respect. Yeah. And then, and then you'll, you'll ask yourself, well, what if I'm complaining about in this person? What do they do? You, you might say, oh, they're always so controlling, or they're always so this way, or they always have to get their way, they never listen to me. They're, you know, whatever. You'll see that your response is forcing them to to do that that very thing to you. And and to me, it it's just mind blowing. It, it's just fantastic. Uh, I've done probably gone through two thousand of these at least with with patients, and every time it it it, it comes out it comes out that way. Now, if the person can endure this. Uh, then we can go on to the five secrets of effective communication. Show her h- how to how to turn it around. But let's before we do that, let let's take another example of this, a more subtle one, because the example I gave was yes, somewhat obvious, obvious yeah. and, 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 and obvious. And, and again, I hope we didn't do this in a previous podcast, but oh well, right? Uh, it bears repeating. Yeah, <laughs> it's a difficult subject. Yeah, it is. It it is. Um, now. Um, a, a woman at another workshop, uh, we'll call her Nancy, said that she was married to a minister. And I had some feel for this because my dad was a Lutheran minister. And so I was experienced both in the family and on behalf of my mother, both some of the good and bad things of being a, in a minister, minister's family. Um, the, uh, but her... This Nancy, her complaint that was that her husband was was overly nice and uh, couldn't deal with negative feelings, and and she said as a result their their marriage was uh, superficial and and lacking in intimacy, and so that's what she wanted me to to help her with. Now uh, let's look at a relationship journal because you can find out exactly the cause. Of, of any relationship problem just by looking at one brief exchange between two people. You don't need to go into their childhood. All the information is contained in any one five-second uh, exchange between the two people. And to me, that is exciting and, and somewhat I mean, mind-boggling. You mean conflictual exchange? Yeah, conflictual Not, exchange. You know, pass the salt, please. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Although but, that could happen, but that would yeah. be... <laughs> right, right. So... Um, so I said, tell me, give me an example of this, how your husband can't deal with negative feelings. What's one thing he said to you and what exactly did you say next? So so she said, um, uh, well, just yesterday my husband said, I feel hurt and blamed when you judge me. So I had her write that down, step one of the relationship journal. Now, step two, what, Nancy, did you say next? Now, that's interesting because those sound like negative feelings, not positive ones. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like he's expressing negative yeah, feelings. Yeah, he is, yes. And then so what she replied was that she said, seems like any time I disagree with you or say anything negative, you get upset. I feel like I have to be super careful about what I say, and sometimes I feel like I have to keep quiet just to keep the peace. But I don't want false peace. Now, let's look at her response from the... E-A-R, empathy, uh, assertiveness, and respect. Did Nancy acknowledge his feelings? See, Mm -hmm. he had said, I feel hurt and blamed when you judge me. And then she said, seems like any time I disagree with you or say anything negative, you get upset. I feel like I have to be super careful about what I say. And sometimes I feel like I have to keep quiet just to keep the peace, but I don't want false peace. Well... She she did uh, say that uh, he gets upset. Right. So there's a little bit of acknowledgement, but it's kind of like drown in, in uh, well, there's some blame in there. So I'd say she did, but, you know, not in the best way. Exactly. And, and what are the names of his feelings on the relationship journal, which will appear on the show notes? When he's saying, I feel hurt and blamed when you judge me, what are the names of his feelings? 
Oh, um, on is he the feeling re- sad? He's feeling sad, probably. Mm-hmm. Is he feeling Bad. anxious? Uh, no, I don't think he doesn't anxious feel at... anxious when she judges him and blames him. Mm, we don't know. Yeah, he, he doesn't say that. Does he uh, feel uh, guilty or ashamed? Um, he might, but I mean, we don't know. He doesn't. Right. He says hurt and blame. Right. So does he feel inadequate? Blame probably. He may. F- may he may feel ashamed because of being blamed. But sure. Might he feel inadequate? Inadequate, yeah, uh, for sure. Might he feel lonely or unloved? I'm pretty sure. Yes. Might he feel humiliated? Possibly. Uh, embarrassed. Yeah, we're making guesses here, but yeah. But these are likely. Yeah. Guesses. Uh, frustrated. Does he feel? Possibly, yeah. Hurt. Yes, well, he says I feel hurt, so hurt. yes, he does. <laughs> Angry. <laughs> That's a, quite a possibility, too. Put, yeah. put put down. Did she acknowledge any? We just mentioned 12 feelings he likely has. Did she acknowledge any of them? She said upset, so... Uh, <laughs> that wasn't even on our list. <laughs> well, not the list you give, but I'm sure he's pretty upset, too, so... Yeah, right. But she pretty much uh, avoided uh, avoided his feelings. Yeah. And did she find any truth in what what he was saying? No, she didn't. Did she share her? So she gets a pretty low score on empathy, kind of like a C minus, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did she share her own feelings? What are the names of her feelings? Well, um, seems like any time I disagree with you or say anything negative, you get upset. I feel like I have to be super careful. Is that a feeling? Well, there are some feelings in there, I'm pretty sure. But they it, aren't verbalized. I feel no, that I have to. That's not yeah, a feeling. Yeah. She's probably feeling angry, frustrated, lonely, upset, hurt, Yeah. anxious. Uh, but she, she doesn't say it. She, she only implies it. And so in right. the way she, she acts them out rather than expressing them. Uh, right. So she gets a D, an F, on, yeah. on sharing her and, feelings. And one word on this is um, regularly when, when I ask somebody, how do you feel? This next sentence tar- starts like this. I feel like. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you're a loser or something like but that. But not even I that. I feel like no, you're always arguing with me. Or... Not, not even without without blaming the other person. No, I feel like I, I can never do anything right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, not it's, a... not, it's not an emotion. Exactly. What, what we're looking for is emotions. And, exactly. And that's really hard for people to find. Yeah. We, we don't have the vocabulary, you know. Right. So she hasn't shared her feelings. Has she conveyed warmth and love and respect? Uh, no. No. <laughs> That's pretty so clear. She's pretty much got a F plus, we might say. And, yeah. 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 And so, so once again, you see, she came to find out why is my husband screwed up? Why can't he deal with negative feelings? And then suddenly she, she's the one who's got really bad communication. How is she going to feel when, when we do this analysis with her? Well, we don't know how she's going to feel, but if if you point out how she's uh, contributing to the way her husband is treating her, she's going to feel probably defensive. Yeah, and and so you you have to have a good relationship, a trusting relationship with the patient to do this, because while it's potentially liberating, it's very painful. And then step four, um, once you know, step three, she her response involves bad communications, how will her response affect her husband? What, how will he think and feel? What, will her response make the problem better or worse? See, she's saying he, he, he doesn't deal with negative feelings. And, and what has happened here? He tried to express some negative feelings, and then yeah. what happened? And he, he got some pushback, so he's going to stop expressing yeah. negative feelings. Right. So who is afraid of negative feelings? Well, obviously she is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's a, it's a mind-boggling thing. In fact, this is kind of like a double bind because she says, uh, I don't want false peace. Yeah. So she, she says, I don't want false peace, but she's expressing that she does. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And and so that, that that's an empowering analysis, steps one, two, three, and four of the relationship journal. It's extremely, uh, it's extremely painful. It involves the death of the ego, and some people are willing to let the ego die, and, and others are, are not yeah. willing to, to yeah. do that. And, and if the patient gets all uh, excited and adversarial at this point, then, then the therapist has to, 
has to back off and uh, go go in a, a different direction with the therapy because the patient may be saying, I wish to remain the victim and blame my husband or whoever the other person is, my wife, my patient, my spouse, my brother, uh, and, and I'm not willing to examine my role in the relationship. But the neat thing about it, I mean, Buddha was trying to lead people to interpersonal enlightenment uh, through meditation in various ways he taught and you know what a fantastic impact he's had. This is just an attempt to take a secular method and, and get, give people, here, here are the steps to, uh, to a certain kind of, uh, of enlightenment and a certain kind of death, death of the ego. But, uh, but, but it hurts. If the person can endure this, then, then, then we have a reward for them, which is the five secrets of effective communication. Show them how to transform, uh, turn that relationship problem around and really quickly. So, but, so then, then is that, is that the, the stopping points? Like, okay, the relationship journal and, uh, and that does it? Well, um, let me repeat what I just said. It's a five step process and yeah. step five is the five secrets of effective communication. Right. How could we revise how you responded to your husband or yeah. your wife in a way that will bring about intimacy? But I, I won't let the person go on to step five and, unless they can endure going through the first four steps of the relationship journal and clearly see their, their role, their role so, in the So how, how do you assess that they are willing to go f- through the first four steps? It's pretty easy be, be, because um, you, you, it's almost like a dichotomous response, although everything is a continuum. But you, you'll have a certain number of people who will just let you know that they don't want to have anything to do with what's going on in, in the therapy. That they don't like this. This is not for them. You, they'll start saying, "Oh, doctor, you don't understand. My husband really can't deal with his feelings. You've got it all wrong." They'll just start arguing with with yeah. the therapist, and they will not be willing to do these kinds of step three and step four uh, analysis. You'll have other people who. Who I'll say is this painful for you, and 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 they'll tears will come to their eyes. They'll become vulnerable, and they'll say something like, uh, "This is, uh, is very painful for me. I, I feel incredibly ashamed, uh, and I'm kind of dying inside at this at this moment. This is all a tremendous shock to me, but I see the the, the truth in it, and 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 I think this this can be helpful to me. And so they're indicating to you." That, that they're they're open to examining their role, and when I do this in a workshop with with a, a large audience, when when one person takes that tender response, the whole workshop generally uh, lowers their defenses and becomes vulnerable and open, and the enlightenment sweeps through the the entire group. They all become willing to to look at themselves because they feel so touched and so close to the person who. Who's becoming vulnerable and tearful? Yeah, and so, but going back to my question, so w- once you, you've gone through those four steps and you can tell that the person is willing to, to you know, uh, proceed with the five secrets, and then when you finish that, is is that the completion of, of no, the then, treatment? No, then we go on to step five, which we revise on paper their response to the other person. Using the five steps of, of effective uh, five secrets, yeah, five secrets of effective communication, and then after we get a good response on paper, we get a we do it with a, with a role play, uh, and we can do that now or do that in the next uh, podcast show how how that's done. Yeah, we we can probably do this. Um, although um, I I do refer people back to uh, episodes fourteen fifteen. Um, but I but, can just give an example with this woman who said my my husband, you know. Is always critical. Sure. Um, for example, yeah, the the five secrets. I guess I can post them on the show notes too. But but the uh, uh, let me see if I can. Oh yeah, here 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 we are. The woman whose husband says you never listen, and then she she usually just ignores him. So we've got the five secrets, the disarming technique. Yeah. Find truth in what the person is saying. Thought and feeling empathy, you repeat the person's words and acknowledge their feelings. Inquiry, you ask gentle probing questions to learn more. Those, those are the, the, the empathy of the EAR. Those are the empathy skills. Yeah. 
The assertiveness skill is I feel statement, sharing your own feelings openly and directly. And then respect is, is stroking, which is saying something loving or, or caring to, 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 the, to the other person. These have to be done in a skillful way. They're, they're not easy to, to learn, I might, I might add. And if you do them in a formulaic way, they're, they're guaranteed to fail. But when her husband says, you never listen, like we could have a right revised response on the relationship term. Yeah. Like what would be some responses? And, and after each sentence, I say put in parentheses the initials of the communication technique you're using. Like if it's TE, that means thought empathy. If it's, uh, if you, if it, if it's the disarming technique, you put DT in parentheses. Uh, so, she could, might respond to, to her husband like like this. You're, you're right, um, and that would be DT. Yeah, the sermon uh, technique. Yeah. I haven't been a good listener. That, that's another DT. Yeah, I've been arguing with you and defending myself for years, and finally dawned on me that what you're saying is absolutely right, and that would be TEDT, thought empathy and disarming technique. That, that would be one way of responding. If she wanted to use feeling empathy, she might say something like this. You're probably feeling really frustrated and, and, and ticked off at me. Then she would put F-E after that statement. Um, she might respond along these lines using uh, stroking and an I feel statement along with disarming. She might say something like, it, it upsets me to have to admit this because I love you so much. And now I realize I've been pushing you away and ignoring you f for years. And, and that, 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 that would be IF, I feel, DT, disarming technique, ST, stroking. Yeah. Or uh, she could add to any of these, I, I'd like to hear more about how you've been feeling. And that's IN for inquiry. You have to generally do five or ten revised responses on paper before you come up with a good one, because it's been my experience personally and when I work with patients that will will come up with something it sounds great, and then you look at it the next day and it looks pretty dopey huh. and so you 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 revise it again, and you have to come up with language that will fit for the person because we all come from from different walks of life. it has to be natural language, and it has to be effective once the person can do it on paper. Then I role play it with with the patient, and that they've got to be able to on that same exchange. On the same exchange, and yeah. so, for example, why don't I be the husband and, and you be the wife? And then we can do kind of role reversals and give each other grades. Um, uh, are you ready? So on, on that same exchange, yeah, right? the same exchange, just exactly like we do in a therapy session. So uh, I'd be the husband, say you you you, you never listen to me. You know. Uh, you're right. I have been kind of closed off for you. I, I, uh, I don't even, uh, you know, respond when, when you talk to me. And, uh, you must feel pretty upset about this. I, I can imagine that, uh, you, you could be, uh, rather frustrated with me. And, and, and I feel really sorry about this just to realize this because, uh, I feel kind of ashamed. Uh, about this, I I can see that uh, I've been going about this uh, all wrong, and and I really would love to change because I I care about you very much, and and I'm hoping that uh, you know we can we can certainly work on this. Um, I, I'd love to hear what uh, what you're thinking and feeling about this. So, what grade did you give yourself on that? I uh, didn't do this on paper, but I, I'd say this is pretty close to an A. I may have forgotten something. I gave it an A. I thought it was great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, particularly, I, the uh, you know, I care about you very much. That 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 helped a lot. Uh, that that you were feeling ashamed it was just fantastic. The uh, the I feel statement, uh, the disarming, uh, you know, asking me to, to to tell you more. I, I don't see any any particular way to mm -hmm. to to improve on that. But the listeners, it's not going to be quick for you because Fabrice is a master at, at this. And 
when you're working with your own issue, it's going to be very, uh, very challenging for you. And you may have to practice up to uh, 10 times verbally be before you can get a, an A. Uh, so what, what you're talking about here is that you're, you're staying on that one exchange probably for several sessions until yeah. they really get it. Yeah. Um, how many clients do you know who are willing to go over that one exchange for several times? That would be part of the negotiation too. What would yeah. it be worth to you if I showed you how to develop a more loving yeah. relationship? How much homework would you do? How, yeah. many, how long would you be willing to, you know, to, to work on this? Now, some listeners may be saying, well, why don't you get them in together and do couples therapy? Because the couples therapists say you always have to have, you know, both partners to do effective therapy, but I've found that you can do uh, sometimes more effective therapy when you have only one of the two, because that person will assume responsibility for changing. And the very moment she changes, her husband will change. You know, the couple therapists are always saying, you can't change other people. And my position is, you can always change other people. You can never not change other people. We're we're creating people at every moment yeah. of every day. And the moment you let your ego die uh, and, 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 and show your humility and show that you're aware, of, you, suddenly you become aware of how, how you've been hurting that other person and putting up roadblocks to, to intimacy, it's very touching. And, and you know, 90% of the time, if not more, the other person then will lower their defenses and you'll both, you know, go to heaven together, you'll die together and go to heaven together. So there is a, you know, a beautiful thing that can emerge from this, but there is a price to pay both in terms of learning this approach, which is, takes some hard, hard, hard work. The techniques look easy, but they're hard, hard to master. The whole thing is hard. Plus there's pain along the way, the, the death of your ego. And you have to ask yourself is, do I love the other person enough to, to die, to let my ego yeah. die. Yeah, well, that that's a big question. That's the yeah. uh, interpersonal decision making. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's uh, th this is this is really explained in your book, feeling good together. Oh yeah, that's where you should turn if you really want to learn this. Because that that really takes apart the the entire process of yeah. being empathic and and uh, learning all the five and, yeah. techniques, the whole theory behind it, and yeah. how to do the relationship drill. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think that uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll close on on this note, and uh, we'll we'll do a, a wrap up on the internet interpersonal model next week. Yeah, or maybe even move on to some Ask David stuff because we got a lot of good questions from listeners to address. Oh yes, and thank you for reminding me. Uh, we we strongly encourage our listeners to uh, to bring some questions to us because uh, I know that. Uh, this may be uh, even more tricky than a lot of the uh, the concept that we've presented in the past. So uh, I'm sure people will come up with a lot of what ifs and in, uh, in, uh, in special cases. So oh yes, this is going to be very controversial. I suspect. I think so. Yeah. So let, let's uh, let's have it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, David. Thank you, Fabrice. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns's website at feelinggood.com where you will find the show notes for this podcast under the blog page and where you can leave your comments and questions. The website has an abundance of resources for therapists as well as non-therapists, including books, workshops, a list of online training groups around the world, and much more. Theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. Mm -hmm.